virtual webinar series. Uh, today, um, we're going to hear on the theme uh, Hurricane Dorian reports from the field. Um, so that's uh, research that was done on the environmental impacts of Hurricane Dorian. But firstly, we will have some words from uh, Eric Carey, our executive director. Mr. Carey. Hey, everybody. Can, can you hear me, Giselle? Yep, loud and clear. All right. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see me, but I'm actually at the retreat, uh, one of our national parks here in the Providence. Uh, I was actually just talking to a news, a news team about, you know, the current BNT, what we're doing, what we're facing. And, you know, what we're facing is obviously a new reality uh, that we are trying to first really identify to it and you know virtual C is also um, a part of of doing that um, you know we had a really powerful uh, BNHC 2020 planned uh, we're going to be working closely with our partners at bar again and um, COVID-19 changed all of that, and we have to go to this new reality. Uh, so I'm really pleased at those of you who have shifted gears with us uh, to, to ensure that we're able to still have this important platform. You know, when we started the NHC in 2013, I believe it was, I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, it was so that Bahamians can hear from those of you like Craig who's speaking today, who've been working in the Bahamas, dedicated so much of their professional science, science, uh, scientific career and academic research career to working in our systems. And we wanted to give Bahamians and Bahamian institutions the opportunity to, to listen and to hear those results. Because there was always this, always this uh, complaint that the science was done and then it went away. Well, BNHC changed all of that. Uh, I want to thank all of you who have registered, um, and I want to thank especially Giselle, who has been the driving force, but also Shelley, our Director of Science and Policy, and her entire team for putting this together. And I think this is going to be exciting, and I just want to say thank you. Enjoy and share and let people know uh, about the upcoming session. So thank you, Giselle, and thank you, everybody, and welcome to BNHC 2020 virtually. Thank you, Eric, for those opening words. Um, we are going to start, uh, so just a brief introduction to the session. Um, as you all, I'm sure, are aware, uh, Hurricane Dorian hit the Bahamas, the islands of Abaco and Grand Bahama last year, um, and stalled over them last September, um, caused millions, dollars, millions, and dollars, millions of dollars worth of damages, um, killed a number of people and of course changed the Bahamas forever. So um, that said, that it also caused a number of environmental impacts. Um, and so today we'll hear from some of the researchers who are on the ground first <clears throat> um, and did research on reefs, forests, coasts, water and mangroves and see how, how those uh, aspects of the environment fared um, post Dorian and, and some of the mitigation and recovery efforts we're taking to um, help those, those aspects recover. So first off, we have uh, Dr. Craig Dahlgren, who is the Executive Director of the Perry Institute for Marine Science. Okay, thank you, Giselle. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Okay. Um, so, so thank you again. Uh, it's an honor, a privilege, and a pleasure to be uh, kicking off the first talk of the 2020 Bahamas Natural History Conference. And a special thanks to Eric, Giselle, Shelley, and the team at Bahamas National Trust for adapting under these circumstances and being able to host this virtual conference. I, I think it's great. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is the effect that Hurricane Dorian had on coral reefs of Abaco and Grand Bahama. And we all know about um, how Hurricane Dorian affected uh, these islands. Uh, 
the loss of human life, people displaced from their homes, uh, and general damage to infrastructure on both islands. Um, but once we had a handle on the, the human tragedy and the economic impacts, uh, our thoughts turned to the environment. And uh, in particular for us, uh, how the coral reefs of both Abaco and Grand Bahama were affected by this storm. And we were in a very good position to address that question. Um, as part of our efforts to assess the health of coral reefs throughout the Bahamas, we had spent the previous year to year and a half um, doing assessments as a priority of reefs around Abaco and Grand Bahama. Um, up until uh, July and August 2019, we were in the field doing these assessments. So we have very good data uh, from within a, a year to 18 months of the storm uh, beforehand that we could then use to compare uh, to how the reefs looked after the storm. And we were using uh, Atlantic and Gulf rapid reef assessment techniques before and after to do these comparisons. So in early to mid-October, we were able to get out and survey 29 of those 67 sites. And they were distributed around the Little Bahama Bank so that we had some sites that were right in the eye of where Hurricane Dorian hit as an unprecedentedly strong Category 5 hurricane. Um, some areas where uh, the storm lingered for days uh, before moving north out to sea again, and some areas that were farther away and might not have been hit so hard by the storm. Uh, in doing these surveys, we are really concerned with what damage the storm caused. And in looking at the data, it falls into uh, five general categories. Um, structural damage, debris, the transport of sediment, coral bleaching, and then the impact on fish, not just biomass, but fish communities. Um, for today, I'm gonna stick to the first four and not deal with fish right now because we're still processing some of that data. Um, so we'll start with structural damage. Uh, what this map is showing here is of those 29 sites, the ones that show up in white are ones where there was uh, no significant change in the number of broken corals, the number of corals that were dislodged and moved from their uh, growth positions. The ones in red, however, about a third of the sites did see significant structural damage. Um, so it was very variable uh, based on depth, coral type position and debris, uh, the amount of debris in an area. And just to, to show an example of this variability, looking at Elkhorn coral reefs, which are some of the most vulnerable ones to severe uh, wave energy because of where they grow and their branching formations cause them to break easily. Uh, we see some reefs um, like the top uh, picture here of Sandy Key Reef, which was right at the southern eyewall when the storm was at its strongest and it received virtually no damage to corals at all. Uh, a few miles away, the middle picture, Ghoul Reef, um, did see some breakage to branches, uh, some fragmentation, but in general, the reefs there were still fairly intact versus some of these sites in northern Abaco in red, where the Elkhorn coral there was, some of it was left in growth position, but most of the branches had been smashed to pieces and were reduced to rubble. Uh, on the base of those um, existing uh, in growth position pieces. So there was a lot of variability there. We also saw some severe structural damage to reefs, um, particularly in northern uh, Abaco here in this red zone. Uh, we did some drone overflights and looked at the reef there. And what we found was that, uh, just like this top picture shows, uh, this large patch reef growing in about 20 feet deep water up to about the surface, it was 100 feet across, and the wave energy pounding into it from the storm simply split that whole structure of reef in half and caused half of it to collapse into the sand. Um, and we did see a lot of fracturing and collapse or calving of, of reefs in this northern Abaco um, area. 
We also saw uh, down around the High Rock, um, between High Rock and the Stat Oil facility, uh, some other areas of severe damage, large corals being dislodged and removed, and I'll talk about that in a couple minutes. But the reef that we saw have the most damage where almost a third of the corals were either broken or dislodged and moved was Mermaid Reef right off of Marsh Harbor, Abaco. And this was a reef that we had been studying for the previous four years or so, um, and actually just had a paper come out on it uh, last week about its resistance to temperature uh, stress. Um, so we had some very good data from this reef going into the storm. Uh, we actually, in April, uh, did this photo mosaic map of all the corals on the reef um, in very high resolution. And I focus on this box here, um, doing before after comparison. So uh, this was in April 2019. This is what the reef looked at like in uh, October 2019 after the storm. There's some gaps in our data still where we're still working on processing the imagery. The, the water quality uh, when we re-photographed wasn't that great, so the computer had trouble doing it and we need to manually edit some things. Um, but the area of the box is the same in both photos and we can do a, a good comparison before after. So looking at the before image, just wanna focus on the, the red and the blue circles in the red circle, there are two coral colonies growing next to each other. Each one of those is about four feet across in diameter. And then in the blue, there's a cluster of coral colonies, um, about 10 feet in total length, uh, with individual corals ranging from two to three feet to about six feet in size. When we look at those same corals afterwards, uh, we see some significant changes. Uh, in the red there, one of those huge pieces of coral is gone completely. So probably something that weighs a thousand pounds or so was moved uh, about 10 meters away. It just got rolled away. In the blue, uh, that cluster of coral colonies got smashed apart by a tree that slammed into the reef. And this was a problem that we saw in some areas of severe damage where casuarina trees from shore uh, were uprooted. Uh, they don't float because they're so dense, so they just rolled across the seafloor, taking out everything in their path. Um, and then there's all this other debris on the reef as well. So in addition to the, the wave energy generated by the storm, the debris also caused a significant damage to coral reefs. So to, to focus on debris a little bit more, uh, this map here is showing our sites where the blue ones are ones that had no to just mild amounts of debris on them. The yellow, moderate amounts of debris, and the two areas in red uh, off of Abaco Mermaid Reef and off of Grand Bahama High Rock uh, had severe damage from debris. And just to, to show what we're talking about for debris, there's both natural debris and human debris, anthropogenic debris. From the natural debris side of things, there was mild damage caused by corals being uh, buried under mats of seagrass that were brought it out to the reef from inshore areas, um, or branches of trees uh, that caused some damage or, or impacted corals in some way. But from the natural side of things, the most severe damage again was from these casuarina trees that were uprooted, rolled in some cases almost a mile offshore, uh, just steamrolling everything in their path. Um, so this is just another reason why this invasive species is causing problems um, that I never even thought about prior to this storm. Uh, from the anthropogenic debris side, we did see a fair amount of trash on most reefs, um, but in some of the moderate and severe uh, damaged reefs, we saw household items, television sets, vacuum cleaners, air conditioners, lawnmowers, um, ladders, like in the picture in the bottom left. Uh, pieces of houses, um, timbers from uh, framing of houses, roof material, plumbing, uh, car doors, pieces of boats, all kinds of other things um, that were thrown about in the storm, smashed into corals and caused damage. The, the same wave and storm surge that brought all this debris to the reef 
also caused a lot of movement of sediments. And that was the, the third aspect of damage that we were able to evaluate. Um, in the map here, the, the sites in yellow had uh, mild damage from sediment movement, orange, moderate, and red, uh, severe. So from the, the mild damage, most of the reefs fall into this category where um, reef, corals at the base of the reef got sandblasted by sand that was getting moved around by the storm surge. Um, and this stripped away the living tissue of the corals, like in this top picture here, uh, and killing parts of colonies, but not whole colonies. In some of the moderate areas, uh, some corals that were dislodged got buried in, in sediment um, and are likely, uh, part of them died. It's unclear whether or not that coral will survive or not. But in the severe damaged areas, we saw either a layer of silt covering corals, killing the whole colony in most cases, or in the worst cases up in northern Abaco, um, about three feet of mud uh, buried whole sections of reef um, that was transported from shore out to the reef, uh, again, over great distances. So that caused some severe damage in places um, where the reef was just physically buried. Uh, that movement of sand and silt and mud also created other problems for the corals in terms of coral bleaching. And this, take a little bit of explanation here. The, the map it is showing uh, the percentage of corals bleached at each of the sites, where at some sites we saw over a quarter of the corals bleached. Now, coral bleaching is when uh, usually some form of stress, usually heat stress, causes a breakdown in the symbiotic relationship between the coral animal and the microscopic algae, the zooxanthellae that live inside its tissue leading the coral to expel the zooxanthellae and appear white. Um, again, this is usually a response to high temperature stress, but that wasn't the case for Abaco and Grand Bahama. We did see some bleaching because of that in other parts of the Bahamas last September, but not around Abaco and Grand Bahama. We had temperature loggers out at a number of these reefs. And what we saw was that in August, temperatures did approach bleaching thresholds where corals were on the edge of bleaching, but as soon as Hurricane Dorian came, temperatures dropped uh, between four and six degrees Celsius throughout all the sites where we had temperature loggers. So the hurricane uh, dropped temperatures, the temperatures never recovered to those bleaching levels. So the hurricane probably saved some of those reefs from having bleaching due to temperature stress. And yet they still bleach. So what, what do we think happened here? Um, if we look at the sites that had some of the most sediment damage, they're the same sites that had a lot of bleaching. The other thing is that the bleaching that we saw was worse with depth. The same species of coral in shallow parts of the reef might have been a little pale, but didn't look too bad. At deeper depths, though, uh, they were completely white. So what we think happened here was that the turbidity from sediment being stirred up um, blocked out enough light so that photosynthesis of that microalgae stopped occurring for several days, maybe even a week. And that uh, cessation of photosynthesis caused the corals to expel the zooxanthellae since they weren't doing their job anymore, um, similar to the way high temperature stress works and uh, leaving the corals bleed. So this is uh, something that's rare, something that hasn't been reported that often, but we think it is probably turbidity that caused mass bleaching um, of some of these colonies. And this one in the bottom right is one that's probably 500 to 1,000 years old that uh, bleached in a period of a week, and we're not sure yet if it has recovered or not, or if it will recover. So based on these four different factors, we rated this severity on a scale of zero for no damage, one mild, two moderate, three severe damage, and just summed everything up from those four different types of damage to come up with a composite damage rating, um, which resulted in a scale of zero to 12. And we considered anything above a seven to be severe. So about a quarter 
of the sites that we surveyed had severe damage of one form or another. About half the sites moderate damage and a quarter of the sites had little to no damage. Um, so it was really variable and the, the spatial occurrence of that damage wasn't easy to predict. Yes, some of the shallow sites close to the track of the storm, particularly around more populated areas, had some of the highest severe damage scores. But there were some sites like this one way out in West Grand Bahama that also had a severe damage rating, which was the farthest one away from the storm track. Um, so we're still working to see why some of these reefs saw the damage that they did. Uh, also, it's important to realize that this initial survey is really just the, our preliminary data. Um, these impacts may increase over time. They may lead to other problems on reefs um, and impacts may accumulate over time. Um, we're not sure of the corals that were bleached, what percentage survived versus died. We don't know with the corals that were physically broken, uh, if they will survive and recover or if they'll die. And then also, particularly for Grand Bahama, we think that the hurricane also led to the spread of disease. Um, prior to the storm, we think that around Freeport, uh, we had the first incidence of stony coral tissue loss disease, a devastating coral disease uh, around the Freeport area. Um, we think that the hurricane coming when it did led to the spread of that disease. So now that disease is present throughout most, if not all, of the southern coastline of Grand Bahama. So we have a lot of work to follow up on. Um, we have a lot of gaps in our surveys. We surveyed less than half of the sites that we had surveyed before the storm, so we want to get back and fill in some of those gaps, monitor the recovery or decline of reefs over time. Um, we're actually able to work on coral restoration to help some of these reefs recover, depending on what sort of damage they saw. And then we also have a lot of before data from mangrove and seagrass systems uh, around Grand Bahama in particular that we'd like to see how the storm affected them. And then I'll just close by saying uh, at the Perry Institute for Marine Science, we uh, led some of these expeditions, but these are group efforts. Um, there were a lot of other organizations that contributed personnel, funding and logistical support to make these happen and uh, just want to make sure we give give all those organizations credit and i will stop there thank you very much thank you craig for your presentation um very informative stuff i uh, hope we can see some recovery on the reefs um so just to all the participants and attendees um, we're going to let everybody give their talks first, and then we're going to have a group question and answer period at the end of the present of, of the presentations. Um, so feel free to submit your uh, your questions via the Q&A um, or on Facebook, and we'll just keep them till the end. Um, next up, we have uh, Bradley Watson, Avian Science Officer from BNT. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning. Morning, Bradley. Oh, so, uh, sorry. Going to share my screen with you and then begin. Yep, yep um, see it. Just full screen. So, today I'm going to talk to you about how Hurricane Dorian impacted the terrestrial systems of Abaco and Grand Bahama. We're gonna mostly talk about Abaco. Um, and I want you to consider how these systems are gonna to have to respond to increasing frequency and severity of hurricanes in the future. And we can do to uh, kind of ease that transition as much as we can. So here is a video of a healthy intact pine forest in South Abaco National Park. Uh, I want you to take note of the different layers in the system. You have the ground story, the mid-level, and then the canopy. And birds use each of these layers for different purposes. Uh, one very interesting example is that Bahama parrots actually nest on the floor of these forests in crevices of the limestone rocks. And so this is what a pine forest would have looked like before Dorian. 
Um, but Dorian impacted these islands on September 1st. And uh, what's very important here is that the Bahamas has four pine islands, Andros, Nassau, Abaco, and Grand Bahama. And so Dorian impacted, you know, two of the pine islands that we have in existence. Uh, additionally, this is the range, this red circle represents the range of the Bahama warbler, which is a species that exists only in Grand Bahama and Abaco. It's a, an endemic species that was severely threatened by Hurricane Dorian. Uh, even more uh, threatening was the impact on the range of the Bahama nuthatch, which exists only on Grand Bahama. And so we as the BNT, uh, pardon me, sorry, this is what a pine forest looks like after a hurricane. Uh, I'd like you to note that the pine trees are decimated. These trees would have died due to hurricane force winds, storm surge, water left on the soil surface after the storm, or even pine bark beetles attacking them after the storm uh, when their immune systems or, or their immune responses are compromised. Uh, lastly, these trees might be also lost due to fires that happen after storms. Um, you might note that the ground story is responding pretty well and growing back pretty quickly, but the pine trees are going to take a while to, uh, to replace themselves. So what did we do? The Bahamas National Trust, our goal is to preserve species and spaces for the Bahamian population and our visitors. And so the first thing we did was go out and survey Bahama parrot populations in October 2019. So we did this work with assistance from the Audubon Society, Birds Caribbean, um, and Caroline Stahala, who actually came out and did the work, along with Anselino Davis from Lulugon Island. Uh, we found that parrot numbers were compromised somewhat, but we weren't able to spend as much time in the field to get very solid numbers. Uh, we expect that parrots should do fairly well after the storm if we are able to continue controlling their predator populations, namely feral cats and uh, the invasive species raccoons. Um, so that's what we did with parrots right after the storm in October. The next step we took was to survey winter and permanent resident birds in December of 2019 on Abaco. Uh, luckily, in this instance, we have baseline data that we can compare to. So there was a study done in 2011 that we mimicked uh, so that we could compare the numbers of birds before the storm to numbers of birds after the storm. We used similar methods in Grand Bahama, surveying winter and permanent resident birds in February 2020. Uh, sadly, we don't have any baseline data to compare these numbers to. So we're going to really focus our talk on the surveys in Abaco of winter and permanent resident birds, where we have comparable data. So we already spoke about the pine forest and the diversity in those systems. Uh, we mentioned the Bahama warbler. There's also the olive-capped warbler, which exists only in Cuba and in the Bahamas. So we're talking about very unique communities of birds. Uh, I would be remiss to go on without mentioning that there are reptiles and insects that inhabit these systems as well that also require our assistance in our, you know, our conservation assistance. The other system we considered are coppice systems, which are characterized by species like pigeon plum, Mahogany, mahogany gamalami. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but if you cut down a gamalami tree, oftentimes it sprouts out another branch pretty quickly. And so this is the effect that took place after Hurricane Dorian. These systems regrew fairly quickly after the storm compared to pine systems, which you know have yet to recover and might not recover for a long, long time. In copper systems, you have a different community of birds. Uh, for example, the Antillian bullfinch in the Western Spindalis. Um, sometimes you have some crossover, uh, but I'd like you to, to understand that these are two different communities that require conservation in different ways on different levels. I uh, also want to note that there's an endemic subspecies of Western Spindalis in Grand Bahama. So we're talking about conserving biodiversity that has existed on these islands for longer than we have, actually. So our study design, like I mentioned previously, we are following the methods of Stedman and Franklin. Uh, they published a paper in 2013 using data from 2011. And their sites, these dots on this map, represent transects. So along each transect, we would do between 3 to 22 points, depending on how much uh, pristine natural area was available to us. We'd separate our point counts along these transects by 200 meters. At each point, we would count all birds seen or heard in a 13-minute period. So... Stedman and Franklin did this survey in 2011 and spread their points across this island from north to south, trying to capture as much diversity across the island as possible. This was convenient in that Hurricane Dorian almost bisected the island, or cut the island in half, actually, 
uh, and separated our points into damage points and undamaged points. So when we surveyed in 2011, we were able to compare numbers of birds at each point in 2011 and 2019, but also compare birds in damage points, the number of birds and diversity of birds at damage points in 2019 to those points that were undamaged in 2019. So the first thing that comes to mind is a comparison of abundance of birds at a given point. And so we wanted to look at numbers of birds in 2011 and numbers of birds in 2019 between coppice sites, pine sites. The star indicates significant differences based on a, a statistical analysis, Wilcox tests, if you are familiar. But uh, here I want you to take away that there are more birds found in sites in 2019 than there were in 2011, regardless of if it was in a coppice or in a pine site. And some explanations for this might be that there are different observers between the two periods. Uh, and another explanation might be that birds relocated from Grand Bahama to Abaco because Grand Bahama was more severely impacted by Hurricane Dorian. So now we want to compare within the year so that we don't have these effects of observers impacting our results. So within 2019, we note that there are fewer birds in damaged sites than there are in undamaged sites. And this effect is much greater in pine sites than it is in coppice sites. So what we take away from this is that, you know, storms are bad for bird populations and they compromise bird habitats. The other takeaway is that pine systems are much more vulnerable to the disturbance of hurricanes than coppice sites. So now we're looking at this and we're thinking about this from a conservation perspective. You might say that copper sites are more resilient and maybe we should invest in preserving copper sites relative to pine sites. But I want to remind you that pine sites hold a different assemblage of birds, a different community of birds than copper sites. And we also want to think about the diversity of birds held in a damaged site compared to an undamaged site. So what kind of birds are at each point? What are the different kinds of birds at each point? If you consider the site on the left, you, you have three birds, but there are three different kinds of birds. The site on the right has three birds, but there are only two types of birds here. And so this is uh, diversity, and we measure this using the Shannon Index, which is just uh, a measure that you should consider for the next graph. So in 2011, we had less diversity in pine sites than we did in 2019. And once again, this may be a result of birds moving from Grand Bahama to Abaco. And it might also be that diversity increased in 2019 because we have different observers observing these birds. But the most likely explanation is that the Bahama warbler was declared a species since the surveys in 2011. So there's one more potential species in the pine sites in 2019 compared to those in 2011. So that's a bit of a confounding effect. Now we're gonna look at the diversity of birds within the year 2019 in damaged and undamaged sites to see you know, if there's a difference in the impact of hurricane damage on coppice versus pine sites. So a damaged coppice site has nearly equal diversity to an undamaged coppice site, but a damaged pine site has much less diversity than an undamaged pine site. And so we're saying that there are fewer kinds of birds found in damaged pine sites, as well as there are just fewer birds in general, absolutely, in damaged pine sites than undamaged pine sites. And so from a conservation perspective, we recognize that we need to preserve as, much, as many pine areas as possible because when a storm comes in, it will reduce the diversity and abundance of birds in these pine sites and we need healthy intact pine areas to repopulate the rest of the islands as they recuperate from the storm. So now we wanna think about the bird communities in a damaged site and an undamaged site, maybe there are only two birds, two types of birds in the damaged pine site and 10 types in the undamaged pine site. But are those the same kinds of birds? Or are there different kinds of birds? You know, are the birds at undamaged sites different from the birds at damaged sites? So we're really talking here about relative, abund relative diversity. And so you can see that in the site on the left, there are three different kinds of birds. In the site on the right, there are three different kinds of birds. But those are different different kinds of birds, if you understand what I'm saying. So to do that, we look at a graph that represents these 
communities based on two computer generated axes. So each point in this graph represents a point where we counted different kinds of birds. You can see on the left hand side that red triangles are grouped with red triangles and blue dots are grouped with blue dots, showing you that the communities uh, in pine sites are more similar to each other than they are to the communities in copper sites on the left. On the right, we have a mixing of the blue triangles and the red dots, showing that these communities are somewhat similar to each other. There is no separation between the two. So this method is called non-metric multidimensional scaling. It's not important for you to know that word. Uh, it's just a way for us to visualize this. I have not run statistical analyses on these data just yet, uh, but that's the next step in our, in our work. So looking on the left, we note that in 2011, before Hurricane Dorian, the communities in copper sites were significantly, well, not significantly statistically, but visually we can see that they were different from the communities in pine sites before Hurricane Dorian. The same pattern follows after the storm. So as a conservationist, I recognize that I need to conserve a number of copper sites and a number of pine sites if I want to conserve the total biodiversity on a given island. So pine and copper sites have different kinds of birds in them both before and after Hurricane Dorian. Now we're gonna look within the year 2019 at sites that were damaged and that those that were undamaged. So when we consider uh, a damaged pine site, the, there are different birds in a damaged pine site than there are in an undamaged pine site. These communities are two different communities. What's really driving this effect might be the presence of tons of palm warblers in the damaged pine sites, while the undamaged pine sites have a much more varied community of birds. The damaged and undamaged copper sites are actually quite similar. So one way to think about this is that if you were to go to a damaged copper site and not look at the vegetation and see how the hurricane affected it and just listen to the birds, it would sound very similar to an undamaged copper site. So how do we limit the negative impacts on these, uh, on these ecosystems that hurricanes have? How do we reduce the negative impacts that hurricanes have on these ecosystems? So what we did to increase these negative impacts would be the dredging of canals, uh, particularly in Grand Bahama, canals are dredged into the landmass, and that actually acts as a channel for salt water to intrude into these systems reducing the health of the pine trees uh, and other vegetation. Another thing that we do is that we alter fire cycles in these systems. Uh, fire cycles help to maintain a, a certain demographic ratio in these pine systems of the size of trees. Uh, and you know, having different age trees allows these systems to be more resilient to hur hurricanes or fires that may come true, through naturally. And our human influence is changing these cycles. The last thing that we have to consider is that we're reducing the amount of habitat available to birds in these systems. Uh, if you consider a uh, habitat with you know, vast area for these birds and numerous birds compared to one with limited areas for these birds and very few birds, the one with more space and more birds has a better chance of returning to a natural state after a hurricane than the one with fewer birds and fewer areas. And so these are things we should consider as we prepare prepare for a future where hurricane frequency will increase as well as hurricane severity. So now we're going to talk quickly about forest loss. Uh, this is one of the big challenge we, challenges we have in the Bahamas and in 2010 there were about 543 square kilometers of forest in Grand Bahama and Abaco and that's including coppice and pine. Uh, but we've lost about 89 square kilometers of that forest since then. And so that's about 16% reduction in the last nine years. Uh, if you consider that this could continue into the future and also consider that we are not actively reforesting these areas, there's the potential for us to run out of forest. And it's not gonna be that we wait into it. We can actually lose species before we lose the entire forest. For example, the most recent sighting of the Bahama nuthatch was in 2018. It has not been seen since. Uh, this is a photo of that bird taken by Miss Erica Gates. And so a lot of our work is geared towards conserving these species, you know, making records of their presence on these islands and working to make sure that they are preserved into the future. 
So my recommendations into the future are to collect baseline data so that we can see how things are changing and that way we can scale our reactions and make sure that we apply pressure in the most important places. Uh, the same logic holds true for our research of life histories of these birds. Uh, we're in a period where resources are not as readily available as they were previously. And so we have to be efficient about how we you know, conduct our conservation interventions. And so when should we go out to survey? Should we place nest boxes? Should we preserve this certain area of habitat? All these decisions are based on research and we have to continue to find out how we can best help these species. So this is the team that conducted the surveys on Abaco. And uh, I'd like to also acknowledge our partners and sponsors. Um, and I think I may have gone over time. Uh, so I just thank you for listening and uh, I appreciate your attention. I'm gonna sign out now, so thank you much. Check in mommy's room. Oh, hello, hello. Sorry, hi. Um, so uh, it seems like Rashima may be having some technical difficulties right now. Um, so we will move on ahead to Justin Lewis. Justin. Justin is the uh, Bahamas Initiative Manager of the Bonefish and Tarpon Trust. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, Giselle, can you hear me okay? Yep, hear you and see your presentation fine. Yep. Okay. All right, hi guys. Um, so I'm gonna be talking today about the surveys that we conducted um, after Hurricane Dorian and then how we plan to move forward with uh, mangrove restoration in Grand Bahama and Abaco. So, you guys all know Hurricane Dorian is the most destructive storm um, to ever hit the Bahamas, was a category five, 
uh, sustained winds, 185 miles an hour, gusts up to 220, stalled over the northern Bahamas for three days, which did all the damage, and it caused approximately 3.4 billion in damage. Um, Hurricane Dorian had some major impacts on the fishing communities. Um, the majority of people in these communities, uh, particularly in like East Grand Bahama and Marsh Harbor, lost everything. Some people even lost their lives. Um, bone fishing, um, commercial fishing are the cornerstones of Abaco's and East Grand Bahama's economy. Uh, we did a study, economic study back um, in 2018 that found that uh, flats fishing to the Bahamas uh, contributed $169 million annually. And just for Grand Bahama and Abaco, uh, it contributed $46 million annually. So that's a major economic impact for these areas. And so these commercial fishermen and the bonefish guides in the lodges that were in these areas were put out of work because they lost their homes, they lost their boats, engines didn't work, they, they had absolutely nothing, so they have no way of making a living. So we know the, so we know the impacts that the storm had um, to humans, but what impact did the storm have on the natural environment? So that's why we went out um, in November to do initial surveys. And so what we found was just from going on the water and running around, um, looking at the habitat, uh, the underwater habitat looked intact. Um, I know Craig in his presentation talked about moving forward, they're looking at doing surveys of seagrass just to see if the storm had any impact. So hopefully we'll be able to collaborate on that, which would be great. Um, Bonefish populations seem healthy. Um, we went around to all the areas where we've done sampling, especially our tagging, and the schools of bonefish were there, and then talking with guides. A few guides who were able to fish a few months after the storm, they've been seeing plenty of fish, so it didn't seem to have any impact on those fish because they probably uh, sought shelter in deep water during the storm. Um, however, though, it was, evident that the mangroves were heavily impacted. They are our first, well, our first line, one of our first lines of defense uh, along the coastline from storms like Dorian, and they took the full brunt of the storm. I'm gonna talk a little bit more later about um, how much they got damaged. So just like to put it all into context and for an example, so this is Brush Key. Um, this is, probably located about 10 miles south of McLeanstown in East Grand Bahama. Uh, beautiful little key. It has the, it was a mixture of black and red mangroves that were hundreds of years old. Um, it was a major rookery for a variety of seabirds, including uh, frigate birds, brown pelicans, uh, white ibis, uh, green herons, and whatnot. And then this was it after Dorian. Um, basically, the key got wiped out of existence. Like there is not a single piece of green left on this key. So um, after our initial surveys, it was clear that we need to do some ground truth and a mapping um, to show the scope of the damage uh, to the mangoes in Abaco and Grand Bahama. And so we collaborated with uh, Jordan Cecil and Mike Steinberg from the University of Alabama to conduct these surveys we were a only able to do them in Grand Bahama uh, only because of COVID coming, th coming through and not allowing us to go over to Abaco. So the methods for this, so we did field observations um, with remote sensing. Um, we surveyed mangrove forest areas on Grand Bahama. We literally covered, like basically circumnavigated Grand Bahama, taking data points all over the island um, from everything from absolutely totally destroyed mangroves to still intact mangroves. We were able to, and then the, then we went on to analyze high resolution satellite imagery uh, to extrapolate from our field observations over the entire study area uh, to map the extent of the mangrove, of, sorry, of the island's mangroves forest before Dorian, um, which allowed us to determine the extent of mangrove damage after Dorian. So the results from this, now disclaimer, um, with uh, this satellite imagery, a lot of it didn't pick up the dwarf mangroves because they're a bit more sparse and they're a lot shorter. Um, but 
what we found in Abaco was uh, pre-Dorian, there were 218, basically 218 kilometers squared of mangrove area. And just again, to reiterate, um, all of this in here, the Abaco marls, if you can see my cursor, um, that is all mangrove, all dwarf mangroves, and it just didn't, it didn't get picked up by the satellite imagery, but that should be all in green. And then post-Dorian, um, there was a area damage of 87 kilometers, which was approximately 40% of um, Abaco's mangroves. And again, this all in here should be red, pri primarily in the northern marls, where you see the little dotted red, all of this should be, should be bright red. And then here's an overlay from before and after, so you can see the extent of it. And for Grand Bahama, uh, prior to Dorian, we had 123 kilometers squared of mangroves. Again, the whole North Shore of Grand Bahama should be bright green, and the whole majority of the East End should be green. And then after Dorian, there was an area uh, of 91 square kilometers that were destroyed, um, which is about 73, 73 majority of the mangroves on Grand Bahama got destroyed, unfortunately. And again, from basically this area, um, just the western end of Freeport, all the way along the north side heading east, that should be all in red, and the whole east end of Grand Bahama should be in red as well. And there's the overlay. So moving forward, uh, results from our surveys and our mapping made it absolutely clear that mangrove restoration uh, was necessary because uh, they're important habitats uh, for bonefish and a variety of other species of fish, birds, reptiles. Um, in order for us to help kickstart recovery of these damaged mangrove systems. And for this project, we'll be partnering with Bahamas National Trust, um, Friends of the Environment in Abaco, and Mang. Mang is a is a is a clothing company that also does a lot of mangrove restoration. So for every product that they sell, they plant a, they plant mangroves. They've done a lot of work in Florida. We've done work with them in Florida, and so it's going to be great uh, partnering with them for this project. So the mega restoration plan, we envision this to be a five-year project. It's going to be a long haul uh, because of the vast amount of area that we have to cover. Uh, the overall goals of the project are to uh, transplant as many mangroves as, as, as possible to help kickstart recovery. Uh, we're going to monitor uh, mangroves that we've planted uh, to measure restoration success. And this is a great opportunity to educate people about the importance of mangroves and get them involved in uh, mangrove restoration. So for our methods, uh, we're going to have nurseries. Um, we're going to collect uh, propagules um, from the Bahamas and Florida. Uh, we'll grow them in nurseries uh, for eight, for approximately eight months to two years before planting. And that's because uh, what Mang has found and others have found is um, if you just take uh, the propagules and just stick them in the mud or the sand somewhere, uh, you're going to get 90% mortality. So we're going to grow them out um, to basically seedling size, uh, which will increase their chances of survival once we plant them. Again. And we're going to have nurseries located in Grand Bahama, Abaco, and Florida. So restoration location prioritization. Uh, from that assessment, assessment map that you guys saw earlier, uh, we're going to use that to identify areas most in need of restoration. Uh, efforts will focus on providing new plants in areas devoid of life um, to help kickstart the recovery process. Um, areas that previously had large mangroves will be targeted for transplanting, like you see in the picture here. Um, this is, um, that's in Thrift Harbor um, in East Grand Bahama. It's a deep, it's a large deep creek um, with great water flow, and you can see the large fringing mangroves that were there before. Those are mangroves that were definitely producing, there were adults that were producing propagules. And because it's on a, it's part of a creek system, it's a great way for dispersal of uh, propagules. So we're going to focus a lot on areas such as that.
so that because the purpose of this whole project is to not replace every mangrove, but actually to plant mangroves in an area where they have the best chances of survival to grow to adults to produce property duals. And then also in these areas is the best places for dispersal, natural dispersal, which will help speed up the recovery process. So for the planting, um, we're gonna do this in two phases. Phase one, we're gonna plant available seedlings in, uh, in different habitats and monitors, monitor their survival. And then phase two, using the results from phase one, uh, we'll, we'll make adjustments um, to maximize the success of our planting efforts. So for education and outreach, um, there's gonna be big uh, community involvement is key to the success of projects such as this, especially with how big it's gonna be. Um, communities will be informed about the projects um, and the importance of uh, mangroves to their coastal communities. And then we're gonna get school groups involved um, and BNT's Discovery Club um, in actively raising and planting mangroves. And then uh, finally, we're gonna get Flats Guides involved in this project because they are the ones that are out on the water all the day. They know these areas the best out of anybody. And so we're gonna use their knowledge and experience to help guide our restoration efforts for planting mangroves. And then we're actually gonna also have them plant mangroves for us um, and they will get a stipend for that, which will just help, basically help them, give them a few extra bucks on the side so that they can help them survive since they, they're all, most of them, if not all of them are out of work at the moment, especially after COVID. So progress so far, uh, we started collecting red mangrove propagules in Grand Bahama. Um, we've also had uh, propagules donated by Atlantis, so thank you for that. Um, built a test nursery um, in Grand Bahama, pretty straightforward. And this is how, this is gonna be the basis of our nurseries um, in Grand Bahama and Abaco. And I think they're gonna have one in NASA as well. Basically all it is, is I took uh, pressure treated wood, uh, four, by eight, four by eight piece of plywood, took a few eight foot lengths of pressure treated two by fours, um, screwed them down with uh, stainless steel screws, uh, took some, um, Plat some plastic sheeting, nailed them down. Um, and this is really effective. You fill it with water and then it's essentially maintenance free other than checking the salinity from time to time. Um, but th those mangroves that you see in that picture there, they've been in there for a month or so and they're doing, they're doing really, really well. And I just collected a few the other day that you could see floating that I still need to plant in um, in those in those trays um, and those uh, the little black trays that you see are about four to five inches deep and then once they get big and big enough we'll trans we'll transplant them into larger pots. So major we're going to collect not just red mangroves but we're going to collect uh, seeds of black mangroves and white mangroves as well and that will really commence in August when um, when the seeds are going to be the majority of the seeds are going to be mature and then we plan on doing our first test planting in October and so that's basically it um, we look forward to working with Bob's National Trust Friends of the Environments and Meng um, if there's any school groups um, or any other groups that are interested in participating in this, please don't hesitate to contact us and thank you for listening. Thank you, Justin, for your presentation. Um, okay, uh, finally, we have uh, Rashima Ingram, who, as I said before, is Executive Director of Waterkeepers Bahamas. Good morning. Morning, Rashima. Okay. Okay. Yes, we're good. Can see good. Her. Very good. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone, for uh, still being here and being a part of this panel. Uh, so I want to talk to you today about something that was a little bit unexpected, uh, but we had to kind of address it during Hurricane Dorian. And like Giselle mentioned, I am with Waterkeepers Bahamas, which is an umbrella organization with Saved Bays but we're also a member of the Waterkeeper 
Alliance, which is the international group that focuses on fishable, swimmable, and drinkable water. And so when we really got started in uh, 2017, really when I started working with Waterkeepers Bahamas, our focus was really on swimming and recreational water monitoring. And swimming for the, the purposes of trying to reach as many uh, communities of persons who did not have the resources to uh, be involved in swim lessons. And so we were looking for ways to go into those islands that we focus on, Bimini and Grand Bahama in particular, and to give children and adults an opportunity to learn to swim. And so we started that in 2017, um, not really understanding the impacts that um, the, the Hurricane Dorian would have had on Grand Bahama. Uh, but I think uh, we, we really need to focus more on providing opportunities for persons to be able to learn to swim, as well as for persons to be able to learn uh, ocean survival. And so for those organizations that are doing that, I commend you. And uh, I'm hoping that we are going to be able to continue this work over a long period of time. And so on to recreational water monitoring, our focus was really on providing swimmers, again, the opportunity to kind of know what the status of the water was. Um, not that it was anything in particular to be alarmed about, but uh, just so that they would have an idea of the status of the water as it relates to bacterial monitoring. And so we have been doing that since 2017. Uh, we have over 20 beaches that we regularly go out to and monitor uh, those physical perimeters where we look at pH, we also look at um, dissolve oxygen uh, temperature so that swimmers would be able to have an opportunity to know what the conditions are when they're going out to swim on Bimini, Grand Bahama and Nassau. Uh, but Hurricane Dorian kind of uh, changed a lot of that for us uh, because we unexpectedly had a natural disaster that uh, was uh, accompanied by a uh, devastating oil spill in East Grand Bahama. And so a lot of the presentations uh, before really looked at wildlife and, and habitat and, and those uh, wildlife and habitat areas that would have been impacted by the storm surge as well as the salt intrusion. Uh, but what we as water keepers did was really looked at the area outside of the uh, spill zone as well as areas inside of the spill zone to see if our water resources would really be affected uh, acutely and uh, chronically over time. And so that's really where we are right now. And so I wanna talk to you about that um, for a while. Oops. And so, as you know, the storm surge went over a, a large portion of Grand Bahama Island in particular. I would say over 50% of the island was really impacted by the storm surge and flood, and we had heavy winds and salt intrusion. Uh, but the destruction of the oil storage tanks at East Grand Bahama uh, for the Equinox site really spilled over 2 million gallons of oil into the pine forest and uh, surrounding wetland areas. And that's really what we have been focusing on. We, we, we have uh, been able to mobilize a team that went out to East Grand Bahama. We looked at the destruction that it had on homes. Like uh, Justin said, we also look at the destruction that it had on those mangroves and to look at the amount of plastics in uh, those mangroves. So I'm, I'm happy that Justin has really taken this on. And uh, Justin, we'll be happy to work with you on that. But we wanted to really go back to the oil spill and to focus more on the organic uh, material that was spread outside of the Equinox site, but into those pine forest areas. And so our initial monitoring that we were able to do was uh, 
immediate. We started right in September, immediately after the storm had passed, we were able to mobilize a team. And that team included uh, field investigators from the Waterkeeper Alliance as well, who were able to come to Grand Bahama to help with that assessment. We looked at um, volatiles, we looked at uh, hydrocarbons, um, and they were able to take those samples back to their facilities and their labs that they work with to monitor that. And so a lot of the data that we have been collecting so far is really to, to identify areas of concern. Uh, you'd see in sample, we have five samples that are visible on the screen. Sample one, sample two are just areas that we thought would help us to kind of create a, a baseline of data. And then we also plotted out areas within the spill zone that are surrounded by wetland areas, as well as areas that had obvious soil, soil contamination. And so, uh, this this story really got a lot of um, public attention. And while the public was concerned with this area within the Equinox site, we were really concerned with the areas outside, which would include how the spill would affect uh, the, the pine forest as well as the, the wildlife over time. And so the map shows you areas that uh, were mentioned by uh, Bradley, as well as, as uh, Justin, as it relates to mangroves, as it relates to um, birds, and um, whether or not these areas will be affecting feeding ground, nesting grounds, and migratory patterns. So we want to include all of that information in there over time. A lot of the work that we have done so far is pre preliminary. We're still collecting data on that. Uh, but it's it's important for us to to go out into the field and and monitor these water samples as as we're each month we're going and collecting the water samples each month where we're tagging geotagging spots so that we're able to be able to um, present all of this baseline data uh, to our eco assessor who we have engaged to kind of put all of that information together to help us to determine whether or not um, there will be any long-term impacts from this spill. And so, and so far we have been able to, it's not changing. second all right sorry about that so far we've been able to look at those four types of um organic material gasoline range organics diesel range uh, diesel range organics volatile organic compounds and semi-volatile organic compounds and we're doing that so that uh, our eco assessor would have that baseline. We're probing sites daily. We're geotagging those sites daily. Um, and COVID has really kind of set us back because we were hoping to have a little bit more information than we have now. But at least we've been able to kind of collect um, some data so that we know when we're able to open up those areas of concern, um, those areas that are growing back where we see the understory is growing, uh, but whether or not we need to apply a little bit more pressure to the uh, powers that be to, to really be out there as frequent as we are monitoring that area. And so you would see here where we're looking at depths, um, some of this uh, wetland area is tidal, and we're noticing that um, it, it really depends on the rainfall as well as um, tidal flows uh, for some areas to be heavily saturated with water as well as some areas to not be. Um, but what we're doing right now is really tagging some of those areas so that we'd be able to go into the field and collect the data over a short period of time 
so that we would be able to provide those results for you and provide those results for um, the powers that be uh, along with our recommendations. And you would see here that uh, there, there's a heavy saturation of oil, but there's also uh, a lot of greenery in that area where the plants are, are growing back. Uh, but what are those effects going to be for those plants? What are the effects going to be in terms of um, uh, growth reproduction over a period of time? And so these are the areas that we're going to continue to monitor temperature, salinity, pH, conductivity, and dissolve oxygen uh, in terms of physical perimeters. But organically, we're going to continue to be um, collecting data as it relates to gasoline, diesel, volatile, and semi-volatile organic compounds. And we want to do that because we, again, want to see what the effects of wildlife and habitat will be uh, acutely as well as um, chronically. And so our next steps are our eco risk assessment to determine the effects of the spill within the zone and outside of the zone, collecting soil samples, water samples, as well as characterizing the impacts of the natural resources in the spill zone. And of course, most importantly, importantly continuing to advocate for the cleanup and restoration and mitigation efforts. And so again, um, even though we still have uh, just preliminary results right now. This is something that we're hoping to do over a period of time. Uh, we have already scheduled to, to be out there monthly, and we're hoping to do this for another six months and um, to have Jim Rogers with us, who is a professor of environmental science at the West Texas A&M University, who is really going to help us to really put that data together. And we've been able to do a lot of this work thanks to the efforts, joint efforts of Waterkeeper Alliance and More Charitable Foundation. Thank you. Thank you, Rashima, for your presentation. Um, so now everyone's completed. We're gonna open up the floor for questions. Um, I'm going to do this. Okay, it's not what I wanted to do. There we go. Okay. Uh, Alrighty. Um, so, first question that we have is for Craig. Oops, sorry. It's having a little bit of Nope. All right. Um, sorry. Uh, okay, sorry. First question we have is for Craig. Um, is the damage report on the stony coral uh, tissue loss disease preliminary as well? Um, so we, in March, uh, did an assessment of stony coral tissue loss disease along uh, the coast of Grand Bahama and submitted that report to government. It's a, a rapid assessment, but um, that's a, a pretty uh, thorough report for um, documenting the extent of the disease, the disease there. We are going to be doing more follow-up surveys as well. We've also done some stony tissue loss surveys over the past week with Bahamas National Trust off of New Providence um, and have some preliminary data for that as well. So I would say Grand Bahama, we have some good data, um, New Providence preliminary at this point in time. And I can okay. share the report for Grand Bahama um, with whoever's interested. Okay, thank you for that, Craig. Um, just so we give uh, everyone a fair chance to answer some of their questions. Uh, the next question is for Justin. Um, so, let's see. Uh, 
Transplanting mangroves from Florida and other parts of the Bahamas risks genetic damage and disease introductions. What plans are in place to avoid these risks? So that was one of the things uh, that came up when we were first talking about this project. Um, so for genetics, speaking with uh, people who have done work in the Bahamas, they weren't um, that concerned about uh, genetics in the Bahamas because there, there's, there's a decent amount of mixing amongst mangroves. And then for the disease, um, talking with Ryan Rossi, who looked at uh, the pa that uh, pathogen um, that was affecting mangroves in actually around the whole Bahamas, um, it's a naturally occurring pathogen um, that already occurs around the whole country. So there's not um, any issue with that within the Bahamas. And then for Florida, uh, we just have to uh, basically go through the proper processes um, that they have put in place for Florida um, for transporting over to the Bahamas. Thank you, Just Thank you, Justin. Um, okay. Uh, next question is for Bradley. Um, good day. I work in disaster management. After a storm passes, where did the question go? Oh, did you just answer it? Uh, okay. Bradley's answering his questions uh, in the text chat, which is fine. Um, so we will move on to a question for Rashima. Um, our water set are water and sediment samples being taken from the nearshore waters um, and, and the nearshore lands uh, around Equinor? Hi, so initially when we went out in September, we had only uh, tagged five locations where we took uh, five sets of samples for each one of the perimeters, uh, but we have expanded that now because we've been out several times where we're going north and south, which would include some of that near shore area as well. So uh, our updated report should show a, a little bit more of a, a range when we're uh, able to get those results to show the changes of the results and show the extent of where we've been able to monitor. Thank you. Um... Let's see, Craig, a number of people are asking to link the uh, research paper you mentioned in your, in your talk, which I saw you had done that. Um, but I, if you wanna send it to me, I can send it out in the next uh, BNHC email. If... Yeah, sure, I can send that on to you, Giselle. Okay, um, so here's another question for you, Craig. Um, my, uh, in your survey of the reefs, did you gather data on sponges at all? And if so, how did the storm impact them? Um, so we have some data on sponges, uh, frequency of occurrence on reefs, percent cover. Um, so we can look at that. We haven't analyzed any of that data yet. Uh, just from being at the sites, I think a lot of the sites that got uh, damaged heavily with sediment, whether it was a layer of silt being deposited or uh, burial, we did see a lot of uh, dying sponges in place there. So we do think there was a significant impact to reef sponges. Um, but we don't have the greatest data set to compare. What we do have though is for all of the sites we were at, we did um, photo mosaic uh, photography to create reef images, at least 10 by 10 meter plots on reefs. And we can um, always pull some new sponge data out of that to look at uh, after the storm and look at obvious damage to sponges and then monitor over time. But we don't have a lot of good data before the storm on sponges. Thank you, Craig. Um, here's a general question for the, the marine workers. Um, Sorry. Uh, has, was there any assessments done on the, the seagrasses? Um, has anyone quantified how seagrass habitats have been impacted by the storm? Craig, did you guys look, did you guys look at seagrass at all? 
We did not look at seagrass at all. We have data from before this storm from East Grand Bahama and from West Grand Bahama uh, mapping out seagrass beds and looking at aspects of seagrass communities, but haven't been able to get out after the storm yet to do that. I know um, the people from BIMRO have been doing some seagrass surveys uh, around Abaco, but I'm not sure what that entails, unfortunately. So we haven't done any scientific analysis of, of seagrass um, in Grand Bahama and Abaco, but just from the, I can only speak to Grand Bahama because that's where we've done the, our initial surveys is that it seems intact, but definitely more work needs to be done based on that baseline data that Craig uh, talked about. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, another question for Rashima. How concerned are you about the intrusion of oil into the freshwater lands? Hi, we're, we're very concerned about that, um, which is why we're going out uh, regularly to monitor that. And we're even going down into um, some open wells that uh, we have been able to locate to uh, kind of monitor that as well to see if there are any changes over time. And so that's really one of the reasons why we're uh, out there as frequently as we can to see if, if there is any uh, impact on the freshwater lenses um, and whether or not we would be able to kind of identify those as quickly as possible and give our recommendations. Thank you, Rashima. Um, Dr. Dahlgren, from a coastal management standpoint, would it be, uh, would it be possible to design a Casarina culling program along the coast to reduce the potential damage in future storms, as well as what measures can we put into place to mitigate human waste from going into the ocean during storms? Um, those are very good questions. Uh, so I do believe there is a way to, in some locations, be able to remove casuarinas effectively and prevent them from, from coming back. It will require a lot of resources to do that. Um, to do it at the scale uh, of the Bahamas entirely uh, would require an awful lot of resources, but we can do it in certain particularly vulnerable areas, perhaps. Um, and as far as human debris, uh, for a storm at the scale of Hurricane Dorian, um, probably not much that can be done. I think what would help for most storms though would be improvements on building codes and things like that that would uh, make structures more resistant or resilient um, to storm damage that would prevent uh, some of the damage that we saw on reefs, but certainly not all of it. That would be a big undertaking. Uh, thank you, Craig. Um, here's a question for Justin. Where were initial surveys done in November on Abaco? Who did the assessments and how was it determined that there were no impacts to fish and that the populations are healthy on Abaco? Um, no surveys were done in Abaco. I was not able to get over there um, because of the storm and like access to Abaco. I only did it for, I'm sorry, I didn't specify in my presentation that was only for Grand Bahama. But speaking with, um, with guides and anglers, uh, once things, uh, once Abaco started to get back on our feet and people started fishing again, um, especially in the marls, they were seeing um, a ton of fish. Um, they, I saw they, they were sending me pictures of the habitat. The mangroves were, a lot of the mangroves were dead, but the underwater habitat looked intact. So there was no standard surveys done, but that was all anecdotal evidence from the anglers and guides for Abaco. Thank you, Justin. Um, question for Rashima. Is cleanup still going at Equinor? And if, if so, uh, as far as restoration of the environment, do you see any signs of it? I would believe that COVID-19 has kind of made it a little bit tricky for that. We have been out there last week and earlier this week, and we have not really seen any activity out there. 
Uh, but that's not to say that nothing is happening. Just at the time that we were there, nothing was really happening. Um, we are concerned though about the pace at which things are happening. A lot of the understory is really growing back. And what we're really concerned about is whether or not that understory will grow back without the proper cleanup taking place when it should. Um, and that's really, really why we're going out as frequently as we can to kind of collect the data on that and collect a, a, a photographic history of what's happening. Thank you. Um, here's a question for Bradley. Um, how extensive was the damage to forests on Grand Bahama when you say it was worse than Abaco? And in your personal view, is there still hope for the nuthatch? When do you, also, when do you expect the full results of the damage to the forests and the bird communities to be published? Uh, thanks for your question. Uh, I'm so happy that other people are as concerned about the nuthatch as we are. Um, we're hoping that we, we can find nut hatches. There are some areas of forest uh, that haven't been damaged on keys off of the islands. Um, and we're hoping that in some of those areas, we might have nut hatches. I can't say whether or not they're extinct, um, but I, I refuse to, to give up on them because if we don't exert the effort to find them now, uh, conserving them later, if we do find them, would be so much more difficult. Um, also, I want to bring to everybody's attention that the Bahama Warbler is traveling down that same path. Um, it's limited to Grand Bahama and Abaco. And in history, in recent history, uh, Bahama Orioles that existed on both Abaco and Andros, uh, the Bahama Oriole was removed from Abaco. So we have a pattern of species being removed from our islands. And if we don't do something to, or you know, do our best to, to conserve them, we could be without those species in the future. Um, the results of the survey should be published, you know, as soon as possible, but I can't give you a, a specific deadline. Uh, I, I think it should be within the next, you know, four months, because uh, I want to give time to confer with all of the experts that we should confer with and make sure that the results are sound. Um, so thanks for your question. Uh, thank you, Bradley. Um, here is a question for Justin. Do you have a link to the economic study you mentioned in your talk? Um, someone would be interested in reading it. Justin? Okay. Um, that's fine. Um, next question is for Craig, um, uh, is there a place where somebody can read the latest data reports, such as the um, stony coral tissue loss disease report and your findings of, of your post-Dorian surveys? Yeah, um, all of those reports and publications are available on the Perry Institute for Marine Science website. Um, if people want to contact me, I can email them links to the exact uh, URLs to, to find those reports. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Brad, uh, Craig. Sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry, I okay. dropped off Giselle. Uh, okay. Internet's bad here. Okay, yeah. Um, so here's a question for you since you're back. Um, does leaf loss with mangroves mean that they are destroyed or damaged and will leaves grow back? And how much leaf generation is occurring already? So, honest answer to that question, I cannot answer it uh, adequately because I do not know. Um, but just from what uh, we've seen so far, um, there has been no leaf regeneration of uh, of the totally destroyed mangroves. Like, um, so during the storm, they were under sustained 150, 185 mile an hour winds, and they most of them were underwater for probably at least 50 hours. So the combination of the wind and then being battered by the waves, just to, like you saw from the pictures, totally defoliated um, the mangroves, and it actually 
also ripped bark off the mangroves as well. And so that that just put the nail in the coffin for them. They're dead. And there there has been no leaf regeneration in those areas. Now for the areas that where there was partial damage, I haven't noticed any. And so I'd have to do some reading up on that if there is uh, regeneration of uh, uh, leaves on at least partially damaged mangroves. Okay, um, here's a couple more questions for you since, since there are a number of them. This will probably be our last set of questions just so we can stay relatively within, within time. Um, so questions for Justin. Prior to Hurricane Dorian, Ryan Rossi had identified fungal disease as a contributing uh, factor to mangrove die-off in the marls of Abaco. In areas that were not completely defoliated, were you looking for this disease? And if so, did you come across any evidence for this disease? So I worked, uh, I brought, when Ryan was doing her study, she came, I forget what year it was, it's probably like two or three years ago. She came over here um, to see if we had the disease over here and we did. Um, so it was already existing here all around Grand Bahama. Um, but when we were doing the surveys after Dorian, I was not looking for them, honestly. I was just focused on trying to, I, uh, trying to get as many data points as possible from around the island so we can come up uh, with the maps that we did to guide uh, restoration efforts. But that is something that we'll definitely look into to see if there is still some, still that disease is around and if it's going to have more impacts just because of the stress that the mangroves were put under, the ones that were still alive. And then also we'll keep an eye out for that disease for the planting that we're going to do because um, hopefully it doesn't uh, impact um, the seedlings that we plan to plant to help restore the mangrove forest in Grand Bahama and Navico. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple more questions. I know you went over it during your presentation, but how is mangrove restoration being done? Um, have you looked at hydrology in the, uh, the place that you are considering the restoration and are you considering using aquaponics to grow mangroves? Yeah, so um, basically very quick synopsis. So restoration is going to be done. We're, we're, um, I'm uh, in the, let me see, you mind if I screen share, Giselle? Oh, uh, sure. Go ahead. You can start. Um, here we go. Okay. Yeah, so um, basically what we're going to be doing is collecting as many mangrove propagules as possible. Um, we're going to grow them out in trays and pots um, in this very uh, technologically advanced <laughs> growing trough. Um, and basically, it, it, essentially, it, it is, I guess, a form of aquaponics because we're keeping these, uh, these propagules in water constantly. Uh, we're going to keep them in water that, that mimics the natural environment we plan on putting them in. So it's probably going to be around, uh, keep a salinity level between, uh, between 25 and, uh, and 35. And we'll monitor that. Um, and then for the hydrology question is, um, yeah, we've definitely looked at hydrology. Um, and the good thing is that we've noticed from the surveys is that hydrology, at least in the areas where we want to do the planting, um, we're not really impacted primarily because of the substrate that's there. So for the whole north, for the majority of the north side of Grand Bahama, um, like the, the hump, basically the hump of Grand Bahama uh, on the north side, it's all, man all mangrove peat that's all still intact from the surveys that I've done. And then you go further east uh, past Water Key, going towards East End, that is a mixture of mud and rock. So that didn't, that didn't go anywhere. So those are the areas we're gonna be focusing on. Um, and then for dispersal, like I talked about, we're gonna focus on areas where there were large mangrove heads or large fringing mangroves. Because those are the areas that have uh, that have softer sediment and that and more nutrient-rich sediment, which will promote growth, especially to get to the adult stage. 
And also those were the mangroves that were producing, adult mangroves that were producing propagules for dispersal in those areas where those large, uh, basically mangrove fed fringing mangroves were, had, um, were basically around uh, mangrove creeks or at least at the mouths of mangrove creeks, which was great for dispersal of uh, mangrove propagules, if that answers your question. Uh, thank you, Justin. Okay, so final question, uh, and this is a question for everybody. Um, so for an ordinary person uh, seeing the data and seeing these presentations, how can they, how can you, how can one figure out what to do, how to respond to it, and what, what actions uh, we can take to, to deal with this information? Uh, so for us, from the mangrove restoration perspective, and I actually just like, as soon as I finished my presentation, a bunch of people started messaging me um, that they, they want to be able to grow mangroves at their homes to help, uh, help with the cause. And so that's definitely a great step. So anybody who wants to build one of those troughs in their backyard, it doesn't take up any space and you, you can grow a few hundred mangroves in it, please contact me and uh, we can get you set up with that. Also, I would like to say that a lot of the work that each one of these organizations are doing are interdependent of each other. And so what you're really doing for one organization, you're doing for the next, because collectively we'd be able to put those results together to be able to find the proper language for the general public to uh, digest easier. Uh, than using a lot of the scientific terminology. Um, but just to share the work, uh, to uh, make those small donations if you can, uh, any, any little helps, um, and finding ways to be out there with us to either collect data or, or to share opportunities when we're going out to collect data to get uh, a general support. To follow up um, with what Rashima was saying, uh, you know, just go out there and experience these, these spaces and these species and be a part of this. Explore your parks and know your ecosystems. And when you get out there, you will find, you know, what the next step is, whether it's picking up a piece of garbage or, you know, telling somebody about, about what you know, what you learned from this talk. Um, you know, a big part of it is participation. So, you know, and you're already taking the first step. Yeah. And just to add, I agree with all that wholeheartedly. Um, it is a big task recovering from such a significant event uh, and whether it's participating in active restoration or simply evaluating the choices that you make um, when you're uh, buying seafood or whatever uh, can all contribute to helping natural recovery of these systems as well. Yep, great answers everybody, um, fully agree. Um, and with that, uh, we are going to wrap up the first uh, session of the Bahamas Natural History Conference uh, virtual webinar series. Uh, thank you everyone who attended and especially a big thanks to our presenters. Um, if you found this event valuable uh, to you and a good use of your time, please consider supporting um, any of the, the speakers and their organizations um, and support the Bahamas National Trust who is working very hard to run this event. Um, by, you can do that by becoming a member. Um, we also have a donations page up for the event specifically if you would like to. Um, and when we reopen national parks, please come and visit them. They're beautiful spaces. Lots of people have not seen national parks. Um, lots of Bahamians particularly don't even know that they're even on their islands or where they are. Um, so make an effort to find out and come visit us. Um, thank you again. And I hope you all can join us next week for our next session, uh, the case for KBAs, uh, which is next Wednesday at two o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, um, Eastern, Eastern Daylight Time. So thanks again and hope to see you next week. Thank you, Giselle.